It is not, that was not the correct video, but it is a wonderful thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's right. So make sure I've got everything. No, and so technology is a love-hate relationship, isn't it? So, but that was beautiful. It was. And so, <laughs> let me kind of give you, I'll give you kind of a summary of what the video, it was it was going to tie into, uh, but not about kids, but it was beautiful. But uh, we'll show that at a later time. And, uh, but it was good. And uh, the same thing is that there's a pastor. Anybody heard of Pastor Craig Rochelle? Anybody heard of, uh, you know, I had a video that I wanted to share today uh, just from Pastor Craig. And it, you know, really talking a lot about even what that video was saying is about really the joy of family and just the joy of having kids and the joy of just the things that we take for granted so often in our life. And so really he comes down to the point of really just speaking and, and talking about that we really do put and prioritize so often so many things in our life. But it's the, the statement that he leaves on that video is this. It's about we need to consider the who before the do and, and the why before the what. So today we're going to be in Luke chapter 10. So we'll be in Luke chapter 10 today, and let's pray. Father God, we thank you for surprises. Well, we thank you that things don't always go as we plan. And we thank you that, uh, God, we can be reminded just in that moment that kids are a blessing from the Lord. In a day when God in a culture would so many times people view kids as burdens or they view kids as financial responsibilities and view kids, God, as so many different things. But God, they're, they are fearfully and wonderfully made and they have a purpose for the kingdom. And so we thank you for that. And so God, I, I truly believe the message today ties right into that as well, God, as we consider in our own lives what matters most. And what matters most, God, is something that I feel we often, we know the answer to. We could, we could say the right answer, but Lord, are, is that the answer for our lives? Is that the answer over our family? Is that the answer that defines who we are in our families as husbands and wives and moms and dads and teenagers and kids? Lord, I pray that that would define us. So we give you today, and we sure do love you. And we ask that all the honor and glory would be to you. And we all said, amen, amen. Well, hey, uh, we are going to be in Luke chapter 10. And uh, we're going to look at a story that oftentimes we would think is very familiar, right? We've, we've all heard the story of Mary and Martha. Anybody ever heard the story of Mary and Martha or Martha and Mary? If you've been in church any amount of time, you've heard this story. And I think sometimes if we're not careful... You know, we'll, we'll, we'll just kind of look at it as information. We just kind of look at it as something that I know instead of live. And so we've got to be careful there, is that we just don't have head knowledge about these stories, but we need to read them in a fresh way. And I don't know about you, but God seems to work that way, doesn't he? We can read one passage of Scripture five years ago, and then it meant something totally different then than it does now. Amen? It, it really depends on really where we are in our life, and, and uh, the, that's the power of the Word of God. So the question I want to ask today is what matters most? It's a question that we really can ask in any area of our life. It could be, most importantly, spiritually, what matters most. But, you know, if you're like me, we all we grow up with moms and dads or grandparents, and, you know, uh, they have their rules. And, you know, I can remember my mom had her rules, and one of them was to make sure I was taking the garbage out. I was mowing the yard, and, you know, I always tell my kids, you know, it's just, it, you know, we had the real deal. There was no self-propelled mower. There was none of that. It was just bagging, man. I had to, you know, I was just grunting and trying to cut that thick grass, and that was one of my uh, things that I did, one of the chores I did around the house as a kid starting young, and, and, uh, but the one I always fought was cleaning my room. 
man. Amen. Anybody have that problem? We still have that problem. I mean, we, we all do. T- students, we do, right? And so just cleaning our room and doing the things that mom and dad expect around the house or grandma or grandpa expect around the house. And so when we do that, you know, I can remember back and I, I would always shove things in the, in the closet or I'd shove it under the bed and, you know, kind of a side note to that whole story. You know, I, I had a friend in the bedroom one time and we were just hanging out and, you know, all of a sudden we had the idea of just playing with like a real softball, you know, in my bedroom. I don't know what I was thinking, but, you know, I end up, we somehow the ball hit the bat and it went into the wall and left a size. It took that drywall out and it was like a hole that big in the drywall. So, you know, like any good son would do, he takes a poster and I would, I sticked it, I stuck it up in front of that hole and I took my Michael Jordan poster and I put that up and, and uh, I, I hid that hole and I forgot about it, you know, and then, you know, we move about seven or eight years later, and then, uh, you know, moment of truth comes. I forgot about it. My mom and all their friends, I take that poster down, and there's that hole still, right? And so, man, I was in trouble. So we think about these things, and I say that just because, you know, we often hide. We hide from ourselves. We hide from who God's calling us to be and uh, the responsibilities that he's given us in our life. So what matters most? You know, we, we can answer that as employers. We know what our employers expect and what matters most to them. Uh, we, we know maybe what your parents expect, or we, we know what uh, a doctor would expect from us if we're on medications or if we need surgery or we, he's given us, uh, it, you know, he's giving us his advice on what we need to do to take care of our body better. Those are, those are things we know the right answer, and if we're not careful, we'll just begin to categorize our Christian life into this nice, neat little box Then say, this is the right answer. But you see, the Christian life is not about knowing the right answer. It's about knowing the right person. It's about being in a relationship where you and I are continually growing into the image of Christ. It's not just about having the right answer. It's about knowing the right person. And that love of Christ transforms us and it transforms the people around us. That's how we can define the Christian life. You so we we know the answer. Well, what matters most? You know, when we we're going to look here in Luke chapter ten, and uh, you can begin along with me. In verse thirty-eight, it says, "As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations." That had to be made. She said to him, and I mean, she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, You are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. And then if you rewind just a little bit and look at verse 27 in chapter 10. Jesus said this when he was questioned by one of the teachers of the law. He said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You see, often we know the right answer. And so really the first thing I want to really focus on this morning as we look at these passages of Scripture, what matters most is that we know Jesus and we make him known. We say, oh, yeah, I've got that. We, we, we've got that. We understand that, Jason. I, I, I get that. We, we all would say that is the most important answer. But again, let me ask, is that the answer for our lives? If we begin to look at our bank accounts, if we begin to see where we, we spend our money, if we begin to look at what we do on social media or what we do at, inside of our homes or what we do uh, with our friends, what we do at work, the things that we are involved in, the things that come out of our mouth, does that really live up to that statement that we see here in Luke chapter 10, to know Jesus and to make him known? You see, that's where we need to get out of this story of Mary and Martha. And, and we, we got to set the setting here is that, you know, Jesus, here he is in a town called Bethany, some two miles outside of Jerusalem. And he's just hanging out with some friends. One of them's Lazarus, the other one's Mary, the other one's Martha. And he shows up at their home, 
He doesn't have a sermon prepared. He's not there for any reason but to chill out. Anybody like to chill out sometime? Have you chilled out this week from school break? Amen, parents and students. And as we've started school back, we just want to relax and kick our feet up. And so that's what we see Jesus doing here. Jesus was fully God, but yet he was fully man. And sometimes we forget that. Jesus is teaching us something very important here, is that he has found comfort with friends. He's hanging out with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. And then this is where you you can imagine Jesus uh, reclining there and just spending quality time with his friends, just maybe the busyness of the weeks behind him of ministry and being able to relax and to just have a safe place to go where there's no loaded questions or someone's trying to trick him and and, uh, Pharisees or Sadducees or other people are trying to ask a loaded question to just try to catch him in something that they don't like. We all like places like that. We all love a place where we can kick our feet up and relax and uh, be with those that God has surrounded us with that love us and we love them. So the first thing we need to see is to know Jesus and to make him known is the lesson we see most out of this is that we see that Martha had missed that but how often can we identify with Martha when we fall in love with the do instead of the who and we we fall in love with the what and we forget the why we're doing it or who we're doing it for so you see depression stress worry anxiety they really are at alarming rates among believers and many believers are what we're pursuing the hand of God instead of the heart of God let's never victim let's never continue in that pattern that we're living in just a time where we're following in love with the hand of God God's good with his hand amen he is he is the great provider he is the great sustainer he can meet any need in our life but God's never called us to fall in love with his hand He wants us to fall in love with his heart. He wants us to fall in love with the person of Christ. And yet we miss it and we wonder why we face so much stress and worry and anxiety. And a a huge part of that reason can be is that we're putting our hope so much in the things of this world. We're putting our hope in so much of God meeting the things of our life. We're we're putting our, our joy and our happiness and our life and our vision and our plans uh, because that's the wrong way we're looking at it. My, my, my. And we're just we're looking at the hand of God instead of just sitting like Mary was at the feet of Jesus and just being in awe of her Savior and her friend. And we miss it so often because we're falling in love with God. What can you do for me? A good gauge for my own life, and I think for any of us, would be just see how we're praying. You know, God, just, just look at where our prayers are. Are directed are they directed more for ourselves are we just praying for the needs of our own family and our own life and there's nothing wrong with that absolutely not but if that's all we're doing then that that could really be a tendency that we're just looking at the hand of God and and we're, we're, we're failing to pray for the unbelievers in our life and we're failing to pray for others and we're we're failing just number one to just worship God in our time of prayer if we fail to do that then it could be a good indication that we're falling in love with just what God can do for me. Amen. And number two, I want to focus on what matters most, your home. Your home. How do we know that? Well, we see this in the greatest commandment. The last part of it, I think often we skip over, is when we read, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. And then it says what? Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. I think sometimes we can just bypass our family if we're not careful, and we just, you know, a neighbor starts at home, amen? It starts within the walls of our own home, and then neighbor can be anyone and everyone in our life, but it starts with those closest to us. Let's never sacrifice our families, our sons, our daughters, our husband, our wife, our in-laws, our parents, in the name of doing things, in the name of serving in the name of ministry, as good as those things are. But you see, Jesus was teaching us something very, very important here, is that we've got to start where it matters most, love God. And then we begin to love others, which we put at that number one of that list would be starting your own home, is that we start there. You see, our home 
you and I need a safe place to land just like Jesus did. He considered probably this home in Bethany just like his home. He was just outside of town a couple of miles, but he was hanging out with some of his great and dear friends, and it was a place where the family could kick their feet up. Don't you want your home and my home to be defined like that? Is that it's a place where we can feel relaxed and it's safe and it's nurturing and it's filled with love and accountability and responsibilities and discipline, yes. But it's a place where we find genuine Christ-like love. So the question we should ask ourselves is, how would each member of our own families define our home? Wow. Wow. No. If we got real and we, you know, from the youngest to the oldest, you know, from, from your two-year-old to your teenager, you know, to your, to your spouse, how would they define the makeup of your home? If they could use just a few words to describe your home that you have, how would they describe it? You see, the enemy has had a great onslaught on the American home. Amen? The enemy is doing his best to rip families apart. We've seen it. We've seen it for decades. We've seen it since really the beginning of time. But unlike any other time these last couple of decades, the American home is under a great, great attack. And it's the breakdown of our families. It's the breakdown of our responsibilities. It's the breakdown of remembering what matters most. You see, Charlie Hall said this in a song many years ago. He said, Oh, Christ, be the center of our lives. Be the place we fix our eyes be the center of our lives. Then he goes on to say, you're the center of the universe. Everything was made in you. Jesus, breathe, breath of every living thing. Everyone was made for you. And he goes on to say, you hold everything together. He holds the home together. We can't hold the home together on our own. We can't do it in our own strength. And so let me ask it again. What matters most to you and I? We know the right answer. But this is not a math test. This is not just, well, I know it, and it, we have no relationship with it. What matters most to you and I is not just the right answer, but it's about where our heart is. It's about where our motive is. It's about where our passions lie. You see, we need a safe place to land. And I, it, it really freaks me out to think, and I think, you know, any parents with young kids, you know, or older kids, grandparents, say it doesn't change, you know, the the, the, the Time of life may change and uh, season of parenting may change, but I'm learning that as my kids grow older. But just to say they're watching me, man, you know, they're watching you. They're watching how we react. They're watching what kind of decisions we're going to make, what comes out of our mouth. Does that mean we're perfect? No. But when we do sin, when we do mess up, we, we know how to make it right with God and with others. And so isn't it something to think that, you know, little eyes are watching us, and many of them, I think for the majority of all kids, they just want to be like their mom. They want to be like their dad. They want to be like their poppy. They want to be like their grandma. They look up and they, they're your little shadow. And so it's so important that what we do at home, whether it's a 2-year-old or a 22-year-old or it's a 40-year-old son or daughter, is that it never ends, is that we continue to try to model Christ to our kids and we continue to make sure that they matter most to us our spouse and our families outside of Christ, and that nothing in this world is going to take that away from us. That should be our goal. That should be our aim. And so the challenge today, I, I love this quote as I stumbled upon it this week. It's men of God. I want, it really starts with us as men, as the spiritual leaders of our home. Men, amen? Amen. Amen. It starts with us. Whether we agree with it or not, it starts with us. And so, it, you know, God has uh, called us to be the spiritual leaders of our home. And as we go, our spouses will go. And as we go, our kids will go. And uh, we all have different roles. But, men, God has called us to be the spiritual leader of our home. And it needs to start with our wife and then begin to look at your family. Lead her. Lead your family like Abraham. I love it. Fight for her. Fight for your family like Jacob. Care for her and your family like Boaz. Love her like Christ. Love your family like Christ. I love that. And uh, just beginning to model everything we do after, after God. And that doesn't mean men were perfect. That doesn't mean we have all the answer because I'm far from it. 
is that, but we are men who are after the heart of God, and we want our families to be after the heart of God as well, doing His will, living for Christ. You see, it matters that we lead in the home. It's up to us to make sure that it's a safe place. It's up to us to make sure emotionally it's a safe place. It's up to us that the spiritual temperature that happens in our home, it, it starts with us. It starts with us in God's Word. It starts with us as men of prayer. It starts with us as modeling what it looks like to be a Christ follower. And if we don't do that, we're missing the most important responsibility as children of God, as men of God, modeling it and leading our family. What good is it if we lead others to Christ, if we lead many to the Lord, and if we have great influence at work, or we have very successful in stocks, very successful in uh, so many sports or athletics or in the eyes of our community, but yet if we fail to be the spiritual leader of our homes, what good is it? What are we missing? We're missing who we are called to be, these men of God who lead our wives and lead our families. How would each member of your family, whether they live there or not, define your home? Is it good? Would you be scared to find out? Would you say this, this needs to be changed? I think we all would if we're honest enough. Third is transformation. Transformation. You know, here, uh, just being an in-service here at North Point, and uh, preparing for this uh, school year, at the beginning of this week, this, this word really came up and it stuck with me, is that is what takes place in your walk with Christ and at home a work of conformity or transformation? Hmm. Man, that so applies in our, our life with Christ. Is that, you know, we, you know, we were challenging and, and during those in-service that we just don't want to have our students conform uh, to, to a behavior because that's what we desire, we want. We don't just want conformity, we want transformation. And that, that really bleeds over to every area of our own lives. Is that Jesus is all about transformation. He's all about transforming from the inside out that this metamorphosis would continue to take place in our lives. That it's not just conforming to what... Uh, the standards of, a, of the church or conforming to what other people think I should do or conforming to good behavior because it's the right thing to do or stay away from bad behavior because it's the wrong thing to do. But, you know, we don't just conform because others impose things over us. You know, we, we do those things, and there's things in life we do that we don't like. I mean, maybe it's at, you know, at different places or, you know, we, we have things that we just got to do, right? I mean, we... We, we all have to do certain things, and they, they just have to be done. And uh, we feel like we're just conforming. But in our life with Christ, it's not about conformity. It's not that we just conform to the, to the ways of the Ten Commandments or to the, the greatest commandment of love God, love others, just because it's the right thing to do. We conform based on religion. But if we want to be transformed, it's the work of Christ in our lives. If we're going to be transformed, as Romans 12 tells us what? We're transformed by what? The renewing of our mind. And we start with our mind. We start with our life. We all need a work of transformation. You see, we can all conform to a doctor, our jobs, uh, to a teacher, a coach. Uh, we can all conform to so many things in our life. But God says he's not looking for conformity. He's looking that we would be transformed. You see, Martha was very busy about conforming to the, the standards of the day. You know, she was doing her role. She was, you know, we give her a hard time, but she was. She was preparing the house. She was trying to be a, a good host and, and doing those things that needed to happen. But God says what Mary has chosen matters most. It is better, as the NIV says. It's better. It's better than what you're doing. Are we doing what is better? Are we leading our families, men, and as moms, as we, as we love our children, are we leading them in a way that is better than what this world has to offer? Are we leading them? It's about transformation. And so if you like to take notes, I would, D.L. Moody says this, the Bible was not given for our information, but for our transformation. Let's never begin to look at the Bible as a textbook. It's not just something that we study and we know. It's not 
something that we just retain and, oh, I've already heard that a hundred times. I've heard that a thousand times. That's always a good indicator in our lives to say, well, you know what? We're just in it for the information. Sorry, but we can't do it on our own. You know what? Praise God. We hear the same stories 10,000 times. Amen? <laughs> Aren't you glad? We have such the blessing. We have a blessing today of so many resources. And sometimes we get to, to read and reread, and we get to stay within these 66 books of the Bible, and it never changes. And we need to be in it for transformation. If we're in it for information, then we'll always miss. D.L. Moody had it right. It's about transformation. So, what is today? Today's takeaway, as always, do on homework. You know, I like to put this at the end of every slide or, or sermon, is really think about the who before the do. And think about the why before the what. See, when you begin to really process that, I think that will really transform our lives. When we think about the who, who are we doing this for? Instead of just doing it. We could do a lot of good things. We can be involved in things like Judgment House last month or VBSs and kids camps and uh, so many other things. We can do things on a weekly basis. We can do things outside of church functions, and we can do them and miss the who in all of it. We miss the who. And we can always do, we, we can always do what do I need to do? What, what, what's next? What's next? I need to be busy doing something, but yet we miss why we're doing it. You see, everything ought to draw us back to intimacy with our Lord. Everything should draw us back to a closer walk with Him. Everything should draw us back to living out of that intimate relationship with God. It ought to transform our homes. It ought to transform the way we view those that we don't agree with. It ought to transform us in the way that we're not going to be spending with our love. We're going to love everybody. And that we're going we're gonna to have... Uh, an open uh, door to where we can, and open opportunities with people, even if we disagree, to say, you know what, I may disagree with you on politics, or I disagree with your view on this, or your worldview, but you know what, I'm going to love you the way that Christ loves you, and I'm going to love you because of he first loved me. You know, and I've been reading a book, many of you guys may have been maybe reading it or have read it, uh, Everybody Always by Bob Goff. And uh, I just, you know, it's, it's an easy read. It's a book that will bring you to tears. And it will just make you cry and make you think, wow, that's the kind of love I want in my life. And he says this. He says, loving each other is what we were meant to do and how we were made to roll. It's not where we start when we begin following Jesus. It's the beautiful path we travel the rest of our lives. Will it be messy and ambiguous and uncomfortable when we love people the way Jesus said to love them, you bet it will. Will we be misunderstood? Constantly. But extravagant love often means coloring outside the lines and going beyond the norms. Loving the neighbors we don't understand takes work and humility and patience and guts. It means leaving the security of our easy relationships to engage in some tremendously awkward ones. Find a way to love difficult people more. And you'll be living the life Jesus talked about. Go find someone you've been avoiding and give away extravagant love to them. You'll learn more about God, your neighbor, your enemies, and your faith. Find someone you think is wrong, someone you disagree with, someone who isn't like you at all, and decide to love that person the way you want Jesus to love you. We need to love everybody always. Jesus never said doing these things would be easy. He just said it would work. Let's stand. Maybe today it's exactly, you just need to come and be before God today, and you need to come and kneel at this altar, or come grab one of us, a staff by the hand, and we can just pray with you, or cry with you, or plead with you, pray with you, listen to you. Love really is the answer. Not a generic love, but a love that only comes from the heart of God are his instruments to do that, to live that out in this world. Do you want to be that type of world changer this week? God's got you where he has you for a reason. Let's love. Let's go all in. Let's prioritize what matters most. God, our home. Men, let's protect our homes. 
Let's guard it with, with every ounce of our being. Let's let God, through his power of the Holy Spirit, guard what comes in, guard what goes out, guard what, what, how we entertain ourselves, guard so that we can be leaders and heroes in our home first before anywhere else. Let's start there. And let's begin to love a world that desperately needs to be loved. Not a fake love. Not a love where we're just trying to see to win people. And I, I'm all about winning people to Jesus. I'm all about people coming to know the Lord. But we don't need to look at people as just a, a people as just a statistic, just a number. Just say, "Woo!" You know, there's another notch on my belt. Another person got saved. Good. Go be fed. Be well. But we do life with them is that we love them, is that we come beside them. We see this process of day in and day out as much as we possibly can, connecting them with the church, connecting them in our job places, connecting them in ball teams, connecting with them at our hobbies, connecting with them at the golf course, connecting with them in so many places, whether it's a hunting stand or whatever. Connect with them because that's what Jesus has taught us to do. You come as we sing this morning. You respond to Christ this morning.